How many of you remember the first experiments you ever did in science when you were at primary school? Anybody? Um, it's not something that we, we often talk about, but it's good for us to think back to the first experiences that we had with science, and whether you're a scientist or just someone interested in science, thinking about what it was that first engaged you. Um, it might have been television. You might have watched an episode of House or CSI. For those of us who are a bit older, for me it was something like Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, um, which was you know, a show made back in the, the 60s. It really does beg us to sort of start to think about what things we do remember, though, from when we're young. And there are things that we remember really well. So, for example, you may not remember the first science experiments you did in school, but if I was to ask you, do you remember a TV advertisement that you saw when you were under 10 years of age, you probably do remember that. Now, there's a good reason for this, and it's because marketing companies are really good at getting us to remember things. Unfortunately, in science, this is not a skill that many scientists have. It's not our job to help people to remember things, or at least we don't think it is, but actually in reality, it's very important that we do remember the science that we're taught. So let me start tonight by telling you about some of the very early experiences in science that I had that I remember. And I'm going to talk to you about two of them in particular, two of the very earliest memories I have. One of them uh, turns out to have been a piece of science that was correct. And the other was a piece of scientist, a science that was incorrect. Now, both of them were very well communicated. That's the reason I remember them. But of course, only one of them actually ended up being one that I wanted to keep. So the first one involves cigarettes. Back in 1984, I was in year seven at school. And one of the things that I was doing whilst I was at school was working in a part-time job. In that part-time job in a local milk bar, I was selling cigarettes. I was really good at it. The cigarettes looked amazing. The packaging looked amazing. They were cool. They looked fantastic. Most of them had mountain scenes, things that made you want to be there. It was really good marketing, really valuable. Of course, at the same time, at school, we were starting to talk about the health impacts of these cigarettes. And one of the things that we were given was this amazing kit that I still have, and I have it here with me tonight. This is a kit from the Cancer Council of Victoria, and it allowed you to take a cigarette, and if you did what you were supposed to in class, you could smoke this cigarette through a particular vessel that you could put filter paper in using a syringe, and it would extract the tar. And this gave us a very, very strong image of what was going into people's lungs when they were smoking cigarettes. And of course, at the end, as you can see, the amount of tar in that filter paper is quite disgusting. And that's from just one cigarette. Now, back in the early 80s, the sort of war on cigarettes and, and the way in which we were really sort of pushing back to try and prevent some of the extraordinarily bad health impacts of cigarette use was still just heating up. But in schools, we were starting to use these products. So this one for me was a really interesting piece of science communication. It was hands-on, which really mattered. That helps you remember things. It gave an unexpected result, which is always another thing that helps you remember things when you, you're curious and then what comes out is unexpected. And it's also very simple. It's easy to see, it's easy to understand. And for us kids in year seven at the time, you know, the most complicated thing we were doing was seeing films like Ghostbusters at the cinema. Um, this was something that we could remember really well. So that was item number one for me. That's the item that worked out to be correct, of course. The impact of cigarette smoke on our health was really profoundly problematic, and we all needed to learn that. A really interesting aspect of the way we communicate science is, is taking into account the longevity of the messages that we put out and how hard it is to actually remove them or, or modify them down the track. And in fact, in recent times, as the original sort of, I, you know, I hate to say this, but subtle debate was going on with regards to climate change where, you know, it wasn't as solid as it is now. You know, I'm talking decades ago. There was, there was an easy, easy run for the media to do a story where, you know, there were two sides. And we, everyone loves seeing that in the media where there are two sides to an argument. But then as it became really clear that there really was only one side, and that was the side of science, the side of facts, we needed to have a crack at something else. And what we started to do was look at um, the changes. So there were attacks on how often scientists would change their mind. 
And this was really interesting to me because scientists weren't changing their mind. They were adapting their theories with new evidence that was being put before them. That is the very strength of science. But that became the point of attack. You know, how do we believe these people? They keep changing their mind. And well, actually, I want a doctor who does surgery on me who has changed their mind since the day they first started doing surgery. I want someone who evolves their knowledge. So we have to be careful when we're communicating that, especially if we put out very strong messaging, that we don't do it in a way that removes our ability to update things. And a really good example of this at the moment is the way in which we've pushed very hard in certain areas of the pandemic. So there've been some people, for example, who've said, children don't need to be vaccinated. Now, when you put out such a strong message like that, it becomes hard to get out of it. And so if you're more careful about it and you say, at this point in time, we're still looking at the risks associated with vaccination of younger, younger people. And once we've done that risk analysis, and we know that it's appropriate for kids to be vaccinated as a preventative strategy, we'll do that. Less of the absolutes, more of the well thought out, good communication of science. I think if we do that, it helps. You know, sometimes it takes a long time for those ideas to, to get across, especially when they're challenging ones and difficult ones that took a long, a long time and a lot of effort to communicate in the first place. The second item was an amazing book that I had. And this was something that this book I loved as a child. Um, the title was The World We Live In. I had this special edition for young readers. You can see it in this image. And I also have the book here. It's quite, I'm quite the hoarder, so I keep these old things. Uh, in this book, it taught me something very important. It taught me that there were 31 moons in the solar system. Of course, back then, when it was printed in 1956, this was an accurate number. We know now that Saturn and Jupiter alone have more than 120 moons. So a lot has been updated since then. It was really good in the way it communicated science. It was really clear, it was easy to understand, and it gave some really great examples of things. Most importantly for me though, it taught me how mountains were made. This is the part that ended up being incorrect. And let me quote from the book. It said, as the Earth's interior cooled, it probably shrank away from the outer crust like the skin of a drying apple. The Earth's crust wrinkled, forming mountains and valleys. Now at the time, there was no real mention of tectonic plates or the precursor to that continental drift theory. This was really clear communication though. We can all imagine an old shrinking apple. We can imagine the way in which that ripples on the surface. And then we think of the Earth and we think of the mountains and the valleys and we can see how that would be a reasonable explanation for what's going on. Interestingly enough, of course, this book produced in 1956 was almost 40 odd years after Alfred Wagner actually gave his first talk in 1912 discussing continental drift theory as one of the ways in which mountains and, and the continents were formed. So this is another example of really clear communication where we, in the end, had to update our knowledge. Now, in both of these cases, I remember them really well. The second one, because I just had an innate interest in, in the world and geology and things of that nature. The first, because there was a lot of cultural context at the time, and certainly I had a family member with emphysema and that helped me remember some of the aspects about smoking that really mattered. But the way we communicate has a, a profound impact on the way science is delivered to our society. And if we actually want people to be engaged with it, we have to make sure we do it effectively. There's two elements to the ownership of knowledge that I think are really important. One is from the person putting the knowledge out, especially many of our scientists and academics, we have tied their reputations, their ability to get funding, even their jobs, so closely to them always being right. This is a real big problem that we need to move away from. One of the pieces of advice I give to PhD students is that odds are things won't work for 364 days of the year. They better be well-trained enough to see when they do work on the one day that's what makes a good scientist. But when the information is transmitted to the public and someone becomes proud of the understanding that they've gained, we need to make sure that we give them the, the mechanisms to update that. We need to make sure that you know, changing it doesn't make them look foolish or problematic. And sometimes that can happen and that can be really a, a struggle. So a good example at the moment is with regards to vaccinations. It's not a, not, not a good thing to go out and 
you know, demonize people who are hesitant with regards to vaccination. What we want to do is find out why they're hesitant and allay their fears as needed, not demonize them in any way, because all that will do is entrench their ideas against the very thing that we are trying to achieve. So the communication there is so important. The communication is actually almost more important than the availability of the vaccine in a sense, because you can have it, but if you don't communicate it properly, it is worthless. Soon I'm going to be talking a little bit about the pandemic and some of the aspects of communicating risk, but I want to start off with a story that I find that is really interesting about the communication of risk and what that looks like in the broader context of other areas, in particular in one case, which is seismology. So some of you may be aware of, of this um, beautiful town, which is uh, northeast of Rome in Italy. It's called L'Aquila. It is a town that was devastated by an earthquake, a magnitude 6.3 earthquake, on the 6th of April in 2009. Now, let me give you some facts about this earthquake and some of the things that happened before we talk about the elements of risk and the way science is communicated. First of all, there were a number of foreshocks that were occurring in the weeks preceding this major earthquake. Um, some weird things were happening. Apparently, a whole lot of frogs disappeared and they didn't uh, return for about 10 days. Now, sadly, frogs are not a predictor for earthquakes. This is not something that we use around the world to predict earthquakes. But there was someone who had some different ideas with regards to the, the prediction of this earthquake. His name was Giampaolo Giuliani. He was from the Grand Sasso National Laboratory in Abruzzi, which is not far away, and he actually was making very substantial predictions about a coming earthquake in the weeks prior to the one that hit L'Aquila. He based his measurements, or his, his thoughts and measurements were based on radon gas that he was detecting in the area. And he actually warned a nearby town, not L'Aquila itself, but Salmona, which is just a, a short drive, you know, a few hours away. But he got the location wrong. And in fact, it's interesting because if he'd, if he'd been successful in warning the town of Salmona and everyone had left, it's likely they would have headed to the very place that the earthquake actually ended up occurring in L'Aquila. Now, he did some interesting things, and it's not something you often see from scientists these days, but he actually drove around his town in a van with a megaphone trying to warn people about the coming quake. Now, megaphones and vans tend to frighten the population, and so the government at the time actually imposed a gag order to stop him doing so. But again, it is possible that if he'd been successful, more people may have actually died. In the end, when the major quake hit, um, hit L'Aquila, and it was a pretty substantial one for the area, given the construction standards of many of the old buildings were not able to withstand even a, a quake that would cause almost no damage in parts of, of the United States or New Zealand or Japan, what we found was 308 people ended up dying and probably in excess of 80,000 people were left homeless. The damage bill was extraordinary and there was a, a huge amount of international assistance that was required and assistance from the Italian government to rebuild the city. So you can see here some of the devastation that was caused by this earthquake. Let's go back a week before the quake. At that time, there were a number of these small foreshocks occurring. Italy's Civil Protection Department, which was involved in coordinating any efforts with regards to earthquakes, because they were fairly common in the region, had a meeting on the 31st of March, exactly one week before the major quake. At that meeting, it was made really clear that although they could not rule out the possibility of a major quake, and it was always best to be prepared, there was no particular good reason to think a quake was coming. This is reasonable advice. Earthquake prediction is more or less impossible. We can determine that there are higher stresses in certain regions of the Earth, and in the future, there will be some release of that stress, but actually predicting things within weeks or days or even years is not something we can achieve at this point. Now, after the meeting of the government official and six seismologists, the deputy head, Bernardo de Bernardinus, went and spoke to the media. And he said that all these small shocks that people were experiencing were reducing the seismic stresses and lowering the chance of a major quake. Now, strictly, strictly speaking, all the small uh, earthquakes were actually reducing a small amount of stress. But what the public wasn't told was that in order to take care of all the energy that would be released by an earthquake of magnitude 6.3, you would need in excess of 30,000 of these small quakes, and there were just in the tens of them occurring. 
So what he said was very misleading in that regard. After the, at the very end of the press conference, um, he was asked whether or not people should just sit back and relax and have a glass of wine. And he was very prescriptive about this. He suggested absolutely a multi Puccioni dock, a local regional wine that people love, similar to the one you can see here. As you might imagine, this type of communication of scientific ideas and threats and risks is not overly helpful. And it put all of the people in the city who watched this at ease at a level inconsistent with what might have been coming. Now, the six scientists involved in the meeting did not counter any of these statements by the government official. Some residents later testified that family members and friends changed their response when the earthquake started as a result of the information that had been delivered to them. This was a really big shift in the way we started to see seismology and the way it was communicated to the public. As it turned out, the six seismologists and the one local civil protection officer ended up being sentenced to six years jail as a result of this miscommunication. Now, the prosecution in this particular case only asked for four years jail. The judgment was handed down for manslaughter and gave them six years jail each. That particular case um, was done for reassuring residents in L'Aquila that an earthquake would not happen, and also for providing vague, generic and ineffective advice. And that specifically led to 29 deaths and four injuries. So 29 deaths that wouldn't otherwise have occurred if the residents in that case had done what they would normally do, which would be to seek safety and shelter as soon as an earthquake started. Now, the scientific statement that was made at the time by the seismologists was, and I quote, there is no reason to say that a sequence of small magnitude events can be considered a predictor of a strong event. This is scientifically correct. This is not the message that reached the public. After the scientists and the government official were sentenced, some 5,000 scientists around the world signed a petition to have the conviction overturned. The appeal was actually successful and all six scientists were released. Unfortunately for the government official, um, the judgment was not so kind and he served two years as a result of this. Now, it's obvious in science that we can't always give absolute answers. We know this. That's the nature of science. Science is also evolving, so those answers can change. But what do the public expect? When they're making choices based on risk, it is very challenging to communicate the information that they need so that they can make those choices in an informed way. One of the things that we need to be careful of is there are times when we need to educate the population and have them make their own decisions. Um, a good example of that is when we eat certain foods. It's really important for people to be understanding that certain foods are bad for them and that they should avoid them. That's, that's education, that's knowledge, that's upskilling them. On top of that though, there are things where we just, we need to put in place actions that make those things occur no matter what. Another example is seatbelts in cars. You know, whether you understand how seatbelts work or not is really not the core goal there. We know that seatbelts save lives. So we've put in place rules to make sure that happens. But I'm not gonna put in place a rule that stops you from eating chocolate. I'm not gonna put in place a rule that forces you to eat three vegetables a day. This is where we use knowledge. In other areas, we use legislation and boundaries to make sure that you know, people do the right thing. I think it's a, it's a careful balance. And you might say, when does one sit in one camp and not the other? Um, the vaccination debate is a really interesting area of that because you're asking people to put something into their bodies. And if they're fearful of that, you have to work out why. And vaccine mandates have been something that have been really heavily fought over. And it's one of those areas where, you know, if, if you are doing something that affects other people's health, then there's scenarios where government will get involved. We have many examples of that before vaccines came in, case, in place. The best example, of course, is smoking and smoking in restaurants, smoking on buses. You know, it's widely accepted now that you will not get on a bus or a train and light up a cigarette. Um, but in reality, that's a very slow way to kill someone. You know, infecting someone with a potentially lethal virus is a very fast way to kill someone. We have no problem with the smoking version, even though in reality, that's kind of a 
generally speaking, a 30 or 40 year deal. You'd have to be on that bus a lot um, in order for you to, to end up dying of, of lung cancer as a result of the bus driver smoking or vice versa. But we have those rules in place because we, we know they make sense. And sometimes we have to put those rules in place, even though education wise, I think most of our population knows that smoking is bad for you. But people still do it. Let's come a bit closer to the home here in Australia. And not far from us, off the coast of New Zealand, is another island known as Wakari. It is known to many of us as White Island, or the White Island Volcano. And Wakari actually had an eruption uh, that was quite substantial on the 9th of December 2019. And for those of you who remember the world before the pandemic hit not that long ago, you'll remember that 47 people were injured as a result of that eruption, and 22 of those 47 ended up dying many of absolutely horrific injuries, some um, dying of things akin to steam burns and other burns. Um, there was a lot of steam, rock and debris that were expelled by Wakari when the eruption occurred. New Zealand's Earth Science Research Agency, GNC Science, has pleaded not guilty to criminal charges regarding this particular eruption and these deaths and injuries. The penalty in New Zealand is a little bit different to what the L'Aquila group faced, it's in, probably in the range of about $1.5 million if they're found guilty. Um, in addition, GN, GNS Science has seven um, tour operators who are co-defendants and the National Emergency Manage Management Agency as well. So it's not just one group. It's interesting because these tour operators are all very small organisations, many of which do not have the capability to do sophisticated risk assessments. Interestingly enough, this is not the first time this volcano has erupted, but very few of you will have heard of the previous eruption, which occurred in April 2016. I'm not sure if you can guess why it is that you haven't heard of it, but it's a simple explanation. It happened in the middle of the night, so there was no one there. So there was a lot of activity happening with Wakari that is fairly recent, and it's not overly surprising that this eruption occurred, but again, very difficult to predict. Now, GNS actually does put out alert bulletins. These alerts um, have a volcanic alert level of zero to five. This is important information. It is not a forecast. It doesn't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. It tells you what's happening today. In the weeks before the volcanic eruption, the alert bulletins contained information about various seismic activity in the area, about mud and gas emissions that were occurring, and all of these water changes and other things that were happening in the crater lake itself but there was no information about change in risk. In fact, no information about risk at all. The public, however, needs to be able in to interpret risk, and that's where things get hard. We have to be very careful here, though. If we start fining and sending to jail every single scientific organisation that puts out information that we have trouble um, using as, as a mechanism to get through risk profiles, then we have big problems. Um, we're not going to be able to do that. Now, this particular idyllic island is one where a lot of people go to look at an active, essentially an active volcano. Tour operators go there all the time, but what we need is a scenario where we can provide both the tour operators and the tourists going there and the people who just work there day to day with uh, ability to make risk assessments so that they're not in danger. And that's not something that we've been doing effectively up until now. It's interesting actually that we have these problems on the ground because when we move into the air, it's very different we have very, very good standards for risk assessment from volcanic activity in the air. Some of you may have heard of the International Civil Aviation Organization. They put out alerts whenever there's a volcanic eruption around the world so that we know that if there are any of those small particles that can cause problems with airline travel, we avoid them as much as possible. And in fact, we've seen in recent years when those alert levels go up, um, entire airlines cancel routes for sometimes up to weeks as those erupted materials actually end up circling the earth sometimes many, many times before they are out of, out of range or are no longer a threat. Japan is particularly good with regards to their ground level alert systems and they put out alerts that actually involve danger levels as well so that people know to stay away if um, the risk is enhanced. So the way we communicate this information is very important. The L'Aquila case in Italy led to big changes in the way information on earthquakes is distributed to their population. A really important step given that they, they essentially are on a plate boundary and if you ever look up the frequency of earthquakes around the world, 
and have a, have a look at the map of those earthquakes, you'll notice the earthquakes trace out all of the plate boundaries across the planet. And you can see really clearly where they all occur. Communication of science matters. It's, it's something that's really come to the fore in recent times. And in terms of vaccinations and the pandemic, we've seen lots and lots of it. I think it was about 10, 12 years ago when I first started doing more and more interviews on my radio program on 3 R about vaccination. It was interesting because one of the things that had happened was as scientists, we had left a communication gap. We'd done so well with vaccinations over the years and such great uptake from the population um, that they were introduced in schools. We were just getting them routinely. It was very, very normalized that we stopped making the case for why they were so important. And we left a gap. We left a gap that some really inappropriate people started to step into. People started questioning the science. They started throwing information, especially in social media around, that was misleading and in many cases deceptive. Some people were holding parties to actually help make sure that their kids were infected with certain diseases to go after the you know, prized natural immunity, which in many cases is not superior or even equivalent to what you would get from vaccination. Another book that I've had for many, many years was given to me also by my grandmother, and it was one of the home medical practice books. It was first produced in 1913. It's a very old, chunky book, which still sits on my shelf. I don't have it with me here today, I'm sorry, because it's very delicate and it's over 100 years old. It had some really interesting commentary around vaccination. So even 100 years ago, it seemed to hold a level of sort of sage advice that not everyone has today, and it stated, if the practice of vaccination was universal and thorough, there can be no doubt that the smallpox would be completely eliminated. It was back in 1913. The power of vaccination is actually really old knowledge. Sometimes it feels as though it's recent, but actually it's really, really old knowledge. It's much older than tectonic plate theory, continental drift theory, um, knowing that there were more than 31 moons in the solar system, literally hundreds of years older than that. It's old knowledge first introduced by Edward Jenner, who started the smallpox work in his laboratory in 1796. The worldwide eradication plan for smallpox didn't actually even occur until 1959. So at the moment we talk about the speed of vaccines and how quickly we're doing things, but keep in mind that the vaccines we have today have been built up on the knowledge of literally hundreds of years of work, starting with, with Jenner in 1796. We certainly did not produce them in a year. The world was declared free of smallpox in 1980. So you think about that, 200 years after Jenner actually worked out how to vaccinate against smallpox. It took us 200 years as a society to deal with that scourge, which in some nations of the world was taking upwards of 20% of the population um, as a result of infection. The way we portray science in the public makes all the difference. Science cannot stand alone, and it really is important that we interact with other fields as well. Malaria is a really good example of this. In order to engage certain countries, especially poorer countries, with treatments for malaria, it's more than just the science. We need to in involve you know, people who understand societies. We need to understand local communities and engage those local communities to help us produce the science in a way and, and communicate it in a way that local communities will take up for their benefit. Our current pandemic has shown some extraordinary scientific successes, but it has also in many regards been outshone by some incredible scientific communication failures. A great example of this is the myth of the five micron particles that spread our current COVID-19 disease at a maximum distance of 1.5 metres. I think most of us hopefully now know that this is no longer the piece of science that we should be clinging to. This is outdated, it's no longer accurate, and we can be quite a large distance from individuals, especially when airflow is poor and we're indoors, and still infect them well beyond 1.5 metres. And yet many of you will probably recognise as you go out over the coming weeks, you'll see signs indicating 1.5 metre separations everywhere. It's good advice. The further you are away from people, the better. But 1.5 metres in a confined space will not be adequate protection if you're not wearing masks or you're not using other sort of mitigation strategies um, like good airflow. One of the things I, I like to ask people is, 
How many of you actually know the brand name of any vaccination that you've received in your life before this pandemic? And if you're like me, the answer would be none of them. I never knew the names of any of the vaccines I was given, whether it was a tetanus injection or a vaccine when I was younger, the brand names were not known. But of course today, everyone knows these brand names. They're thrown about all the time. If we think back to near the start of the pandemic, when we were first um, getting some of the first vaccines into Australia, we had three really interesting candidates up front. The first one was the Pfizer vaccine, which we all know very well now. This was a problem though, because you may recall at the time, the requirements for it to be moved around the country needed uh, refrigeration of minus 70 degrees Celsius. That temperature is really hard to come by. Our major hospitals usually have refrigeration sites that can handle it, but local pharmacies, local GP clinics, and certainly transport vehicles are few and far between that would be able to um, account for such a temperature requirement to move the Pfizer vaccine around safely. Of course, this has changed now. At the same time, we had the AstraZeneca vaccine, a very interesting vaccine that we were going to be able to manufacture right here in Melbourne, which would have been a substantial advantage to us as a, as a country. It was excellent in that you could uh, transport it around at minus four degrees Celsius, or as I like to say, in the back of your car, in an esky, that'll do. You don't need to keep it very cold. Every pharmacy, every supermarket, you know, half of the locations we go into in terms of shops have refrigeration adequate to store something at minus four degrees. Then there was the University of Queensland's vaccine efforts. Um, that looked like it was going to be one of the shining lights for Australia, producing one of the world's first ever successful vaccines against this deadly disease. Unfortunately, some of the um, mechanisms for manufacture of this particular vaccine meant that there were some diagnostic tests that showed up positive for HIV when a person had been vaccinated by this. This doesn't seem like a big issue unless you start considering things like our blood supply, where we want to be able to screen for HIV. And if you can't do that for anyone who's vaccinated with that particular vaccine, then you have a problem. So that was immediately scratched off the list. University of Queensland researchers are working hard even now to produce vaccines that won't have this problem. All of our vaccines have side effects. That's true for every vaccine that you've ever had in your life. All medicines have side effects as well. In fact, uh, the one thing you probably don't ever want to do is pull out that little sheet of paper in some medications and start reading all the side effects. It's a great way to enhance your anxiety when you take medicines. Most of them have many side effects listed. But rarely do we find a scenario where society puts so much scrutiny at the same time with so many people taking the one medication at the same time in, in such a short space of time as well. And we've seen that with these vaccines and things get highlighted very quickly. In the early days of the vaccination, we saw some reports coming out of parts of Europe. For example, in Norway, there were 27 elderly patients who actually died of the, apparently died of getting the Pfizer jab literally within a day. Now, as it turned out, that was a correlation that occurred. These patients would have died anyway. And in fact, a large number, as in any society of elderly patients, will pass away on a given day. It just so happened that some of them also had the Pfizer injection on that day. It was later shown to be correlation only, but that news reverberated around the world very quickly, and it was important for scientists to get on top of that as fast as possible. Here, we started hearing about blood clots in the AstraZeneca vaccine um, uptake. That was very problem problematic for us. The numbers were unclear, but the media absolutely exploded on this issue as soon as it started. There were a number of countries that halted use, and we started seeing all sorts of information coming out. Initially, in the elderly, it was halted, and then later, it was halted in the young. And we started seeing some really um, problematic headlines in some of our newspapers with regards to what was going on with AstraZeneca. And here's where the communication of science can really get out of step with reality. These are the sorts of headlines that were coming out locally that people were reading just as we were trying to convince people of the importance of vaccination. Some of these horrendous pictures are ones that you don't forget easily when you see them. Even some of our more sensible newspapers were producing large numbers of stories that everyone was seeing on the dangers associated with vaccinations. You see here, we're switch switching between banning it for the elderly to banning it for the young. 
and it was ongoing. And we heard about these blood clots all the time. So let's talk for a moment about some of the numbers that we actually saw and some of the numbers that are currently uh, going around with regards to these blood clots. It looked like we were getting about 3.1 3 per 100,000 in those under 50 years of age. So that's the incidence of blood clots from people getting the AstraZeneca vaccine. So here in Melbourne, we often put things in terms of MCGs of people. MCG holds about 100,000 people. So you fill up the MCG, give everyone an AstraZeneca vaccination, three of them end up with a blood clot of some type in their body. That's a little different to women who take the contra contraceptive pill um, where you only need about 1,000 people actually to get one incident of blood clots. Different sorts of blood clots, but all the same. It gives us an idea of the comparative risk. And I don't think any of you, unless you're actually on the pill or have spoken to your doctor about it, um, would have heard anything in the general media about that risk with regards to blood clots um, due to the contraceptive pill. Of course, as I said before, a lot of scrutiny on these vaccines, which is, which is appropriate, but sometimes it can get out of hand. Now, if we think about what was going on around the world with regards to deaths due to, due to the virus itself, um, the numbers, and these numbers are true as of about a few days ago from this recording, so 1st of March, shall we say, 2022, the death rate per, and we're still in MCG numbers, 100,000, in the US, about 289 people out of 100,000 end up dying of COVID as a result of the pandemic. So think about that. You go to the MCG to see a game and 289 people don't leave. That's the chance of dying of COVID in the US. This, this data is all from Johns Hopkins University. You're a lot better off if you, you're in Vietnam. Um, in Vietnam, it's only 42 people don't leave the MCG. In Japan, it's 18.7. And in Australia, where we were doing so well, that number is starting to notch up and we're currently sitting at 20. So 20 people out of the MCG crowd would not come home. Now, these are significant numbers because when you start multiplying them out by the total population of these countries, we start talking about very large numbers of deaths, as you can imagine. But fear spread very quickly as a result of some of the information on these vaccines. And one of the things that's interesting about fear, especially around science, is that it's very hard to put it back in the bottle once it's out. So the uptake of vaccines was problematic around AstraZeneca as a result of the many, many communications that were coming out through the media. The interesting thing is, is in total, we have actually delivered 11.6 million doses as of the 30th of September last year of the AstraZeneca vaccine. There were 148 cases uh, registered of the um, blood clots in people, and sadly, eight people uh, early on died of those blood clots. We are now very, very good at both detecting when they're occurring and actually managing those blood clots when they occur. Of course, you don't see that part in the media. You don't see the progress because it doesn't sell as well as the initial fear. Of course, we've heard similar things with the Pfizer vaccine more recently with the incidences of myocarditis or some of the issues that can happen with hearts in young males as a result of that vaccination. Um, this is something that is also problematic. The numbers in the US after the second dose of um, Pfizer for those under the age of 30 seem to be around six out of 100,000. So this is something that um, you don't necessarily die from, but it is something that is of concern and again, a side effect that we need to, to look at. Of course, the chances of getting the same sorts of problems from COVID itself are far higher. So we're focused on the vaccines, but those vaccines are actually stopping a lot of people from dying. One of the things that we need to do in order to make science more connected with the public, especially through media, is get better at simple, simple sort of language and, and, and simple ways of describing things. So one of the phrases I often will use is the science never speaks for itself. Um, sometimes you'll hear this statement, you know, oh, the science speaks for itself, you know, it's so important. But actually it doesn't, it never does, because that doesn't take into, into account the key element, which is the audience you're talking to. Um, you don't know what that person's experience with science is, you don't know how linked up they are with science or what it's meant in their lives. They may be someone who's had a, a really traumatic or bad healthcare experience, for example, and might be really anti-science as a result of that. So we have to be very careful that we think about the audience we're trying to deliver to. The media is a tool that we can use, but the media has its own set of KPIs and drivers 
These don't overlap with the drivers of scientists trying to get information to the public. What I would like to see is a lot more effort being put in by large organisations, science organisations, to communicate with the public more directly. And I think this is something that we can do. If we wait for the media clicks, if we wait for the media to be interested, then it sort of falls into that category of, yes, there's fear stories and everyone loves that. But one of the things that we know is that people learn better when they're curious. Science is something that we can really make people curious about and people learn as a result of that. There's been example studies where people have been put in MRIs and they've been put into a state of curiosity before being asked to remember a series of things and they're better at it as a result when they're prompted with curiosity. So there are alternatives to fear to get messages across and, and certainly to have them land. But it's probably not what you're going to find through your mainstream media organisations. There are some media organisations that do this really well. I mean, if we look at some of the you know, National, Graphic Seri National Geographic series and so forth, um, we, we know there are communicators there who are incredibly good at getting information across in ways that, that land. Their audiences obviously aren't as big as we would like them to be but they do a good job. I don't think we're going to convert our media overnight into being an organisation that just tells stories that are interesting. They sell fear, they sell surprise. Um, we need to get better at using that, but to do that we need to train our scientists a lot more. You can go through your entire primary school, high school years, through your entire university degree, do a PhD, and never have sat through even an hour of communication training. That's not true for English, maths, half the other subjects you do that we take really seriously. But communication as a tool is used when you write research papers, when you talk to the public, when you apply for jobs, when you talk to your family members. Every single aspect of your life requires you to be a good communicator, and we don't teach any of that. It's something that is missing and something we need to do a lot more of. There's one last piece of information I'd, I'd like to sort of show you um, that came out in the last couple of weeks. This is, this is an interesting way in which we communicate science and we communicate things, especially around health. Health has been an area where the communication of science has been problematic for many years. I'm sure many of you have heard that coffee is good for you. You've probably also heard that coffee is bad for you. The way in which we deliver information in terms of health can be very confusing without real concrete comparisons that we can make. This is a piece of information that was tweeted out by the Australian Government's Department of Health just recently. It talked about a mechanism for the reduction of anxiety. Now, for anyone watching this who has had any sort of anxiety disorder in their life, they will probably feel a little bit hurt by the idea that something as simple as hydration will solve your problem. Now, of course, if we read this information in detail, it says, are you drinking enough water? Water helps our body and brain function properly, keep yourself hydrated is a simple way to reduce anxiety in your life. I have no doubt at all that a really hydrated individual will be feeling angry, anxious, all sorts of things that they wouldn't feel when they're otherwise hydrated. You could probably say the same thing if they're really hungry. But to say that this is in a sense or to at least imply that this is a way to reduce anxiety is a form of communication of science that I don't agree with at all. It belittles those who have anxiety disorders and it gives information that is not helpful to them and at the same time lowers the importance of anxiety as a very significant health issue that we need to address. For those who have very, really significant anxiety disorders, this information is not only not helpful, but it also minimises the impact that that anxiety has on their life. We need to do better than this and we certainly can. The usability of science for me is a temporal problem. It's one of timing. So there was a guy named Charles Towns, more than 70 years ago, I think now, 60, 70 years ago. I met him once at a conference, really interesting guy. And he was looking for a particular sort of light source for astronomy. He was, he was working in the area of astrophysics. And he created something called the MASER, the microwave version of the laser, which we now commonly use. Now, I can tell you when he was making the MASER, he had no interest in DVD players or you know, surgical techniques or any of the other myriad of applications that we've found for the laser. If you went back to the 50s and 60s and asked people about the value of his science, he was an astronomy guy. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting to learn about the universe. It wasn't in people's homes, wasn't in the street, wasn't being used in the ways we use them today. So there, there wouldn't have been a lot of uptake. And we have to look at science and its applicability 
over this more temporal lens and talk to people more about these sorts of examples where we say, okay, this piece of very blue sky, if you like, you know, very non-applied science over a period of 50 to 70 years has become one of the most applied and widely distributed pieces of technology that the world has ever seen. And we don't know which ones they're going to be. We just don't know. So if we think about the early work done by Albert Einstein, you know, it led to things like the sensors that you use when you walk through an automatic door. You know, all of these things take time to come into play for society. What we need to be doing is teaching everyone, educating everyone on understanding that longevity of science and the longevity of understanding. The vaccination scenario is a great example of that. These vaccines haven't crept into our world inside of you know, 24 months of a pandemic. They are the result of 200 years of scientific research. We see the same with much of our knowledge with regards to the changing climate, much of our knowledge with regards to species extinctions. All of this is based on decades, if not centuries, of information we've built up. We see some of the applications now. But if we want those same sorts of applications for us in our society 100 years from now, 200 years from now, we need to keep investing in science in the way that was done many, many decades ago. We've moved away from that. There's a focus now on how will society use it? What will I get today? And that's the wrong approach with science. That's industry. That's what industry is for. Science is not in that game. Science is in the long-term game. And we have to make sure it's respected as such. The communication of science has always been a challenge. We've seen this with things like stem cells. We've seen this with things like vaccines, earthquakes, volcanoes, medical risks, and of course, the one that we all hear about all the time, which is climate change, a very difficult area to communicate. We hear problems with science communication around how we accept need for environmental protection, around energy, and the list goes on. In recent years, poor communication has actually cost lives. The science is there, the science is solid, and science makes its mistakes, but it tends to evolve over time, always in a positive, positive direction. But our communication of science is lagging that, and we can do a lot better. I think the more we miscommunicate science, the more we're putting lives at risk. We actually need more people trained in science, not scientists, strong distinction. We need more people who are trained in science, and we need more scientists who are trained in good communication of their science. This is something that's really important. I have a smallpox vaccination scar on my arm. I'm that old. Many of you watching this will not have that. That is the power of science. That is extraordinary. Vaccination works. The fact that I have that scar and the fact that just a few decades later, no one in the entire world needs to have that vaccination anymore is an extraordinary achievement, which to be fair, took a total of 200 years but we got there and we eliminated the virus that was killing very large numbers of people. But we need to be mindful that science can't achieve these goals on its own. We need to interact really strongly with the arts, with the social sciences, with community leaders, and with all other disciplines. Science is great, it does some amazing things, but society is made up of a lot more than just science. And scientists need to engage with other parts of society as much as they possibly can, especially at the moment. We really need to look beyond the equations, go beyond the experiments. We need to make sure that we set new standards for how we are communicating into the future. If we do that, we'll get the most out of our science, we'll minimise the toll that many of the threats currently take on our society, and we'll try and move into a scenario where our knowledge is actually of value to us rather than harming us. Thank you for your attention. The one thing I'd love people to take away from the talk today is that no matter how good our science is, it really depends on communication as to whether or not it hits the ground in the way we would like it to. The communication is the core element of getting our science across to the public. We've known this for a long time. We haven't done much about it. There's little pieces here and there, but overall, I would love to see every scientist learning more and more about communication. It will serve them well in every aspect of their career, and we just need to do more of it.